Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we look at trade unions and the rise of the Labour Party, conscription, charitable work and refugees, internees and prisoners of war. We hear now from Dr Pierre Persegle about how the Home Front coped with the influx of refugees. My name is Pierre Persegle. I'm Associate Professor of Modern History at the University of Warwick. I'm a social historian of the First World War. I've done a lot of work in the urban history of the conflict, focusing specifically on France, Britain, and increasingly on the Belgian experience of the war. Around about a dozen million people had to flee from military operations across Europe during the First World War. And I'm specifically interested in the experience of Belgian refugees. When the German armies invaded Belgium and France in August 1914, up to four million people fled the advance of German troops and the violence committed in the course of the invasion. There were fleeing two different types of violence, the violence of the battlefield, obviously enough, but also the particular type of violence committed against civilians by the German army, what is commonly referred to as the German atrocities. And many of these people will find refuge in France, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Britain in particular. The bulk of Belgian refugees arrive in Britain very soon after the invasion. In fact, by September, October 1914, almost 250,000 Belgian refugees will be in Britain. Under this common label of Belgian refugees, you actually find people coming from around about 29 countries, and yet they were all called Belgian refugees for one simple reason is that 95% of them were Belgians. Of course, Belgium was and still is a multilingual, multicultural country, and so you had two main linguistic communities, the Flemish-speaking Belgian citizens and the French-speaking so-called Wallons, who all came to Britain. The main port of entry is at Foxstone. Then Belgian refugees will be sent to London by train. They will arrive at the main stations in the city, Charing Cross, Liverpool Street. And from that point, they will then be distributed across the country. Now, London nonetheless remain the centre of Belgian life. It's very difficult to give accurate numbers for a range of reasons, but about 35-40% of the overall Belgian population in Britain during the war stayed in London. So you have about 20,000 Belgian refugees who found their way to Scotland, about 4,500 went to Wales, about 3,000 refugees ended up in Ireland. One of the reasons why London remained a point of fixation, as it were, for the refugees is that, of course, they could easily find a job there and benefit from the presence of Belgian entrepreneurs that were quite keen to employ their fellow countrymen and women. Belgium is, like Britain, an early industrializer in Europe in the 19th century. So by 1914, there are already a great deal of links, exchanges, and particularly trade links between Belgium and Britain. As a result, there are existing networks in place and also already a Belgian presence in Britain and in London in particular, which will then be supporting Belgian refugees. When the Belgian refugees arrived in the autumn of 1914 in Britain, the British government, not least because it already has a fair amount on its plate, but also because it is quite keen to have civil society take up as much of the work and relief operation as possible, is effectively letting civil society deal with this crisis. A war refugees committee is created in 1914 and the British government is keen to support but not necessarily take the lead. Now this position will become increasingly difficult to hold as in 1915 and 1916 the demands of industrial warfare are now increasing the pressure on the British home front which would then lead the state gradually 
to play an increasingly important role, in particular, an increasingly important financial role in supporting Belgian refugees in Britain. The contribution of Belgian refugees to the Wireford will take two forms. First, they will be taking up jobs, employment in Britain, not necessarily in the war industries, but will nonetheless be expected and also be looking themselves to contribute to the war economy, not least, of course, as a way to support themselves. The other way in which they contributed to the war efforts was through military service because Belgian citizens remain liable for conscription. Young men were liable to join the Belgian army. You had a very small Belgian army still fighting on the Western Front, whose military involvement was very limited, not less because the King of Belgium was very keen to ensure its survival. When the Belgian refugees arrive in Britain, they play a very important role in the cultural mobilization of Britain during the war. As victims of the German invasions, they are seen as victims of German barbarity. The idea, of course, is that Germany represents a particularly dangerous threat, an existential threat, and that the fate of Belgium and the fate of Belgian refugee is an indication of the type of things that could happen potentially to Britain should the Kaiser win the war. So the Belgian refugees are idealized victims in Britain in 1914. But they're also considered heroes because their very presence on the British Armed front is seen as an exemplar of the resistance that brave little Belgium, as it was called at the time, put up against this feared and fierce enemy that is the German army. Now that will change gradually for a range of reasons. By 1915, a time where Britons themselves are facing the demands of warfare, are increasingly mobilized, not simply militarily, but also economically, when the pressures, the financial, economic, human, and psychological pressures of war are brought to bear on the British home front. The Belgian refugees are not necessarily seen as specific victims of the war any longer because they are now part of a society that is increasingly feeling victimized as a whole. They are being asked to contribute as much as they possibly can because the rest of the local population is also being asked to contribute. So what had made them special in the eyes of the British population tend to be, if not forgotten, but is not considered as important in 1915, 1916, as it was when they first arrived in 1914. 1915 is an important year because this is the time when you can see a radicalization of the war on the Western Front in particular, the first stages of this increased totalization of the war effort. Battles such as the Battle of Luz in September 1915 have demonstrated the cost that Britain would be paying in this war. Soldiers are gradually coming back and of course families start being notified of the loss of their relatives and friends. So it is in this context that the perception of Belgian refugees gradually changes. By 1915, the attitude of Britons toward Belgian refugees is changing. That includes people who have been actively involved in relieving the suffering of the refugees. I've got an interesting quote that I'd like to read to you. So this is taken from the diary of a young lady living in London in 1914-1915. Her name is Miss Coles, and she's been very involved in relief of and support for Belgian refugees. As she puts it in her diary, everyone was Belgian mad for time. And she goes on to describe what she and her mother did along with her friends to help the refugees. She mentions the amount of money that they raised. We made quite a considerable sum, and it was great fun. But the Belgians are not grateful. They won't do a stroke of work and grumble at everything and their morals. It may be true enough that Belgium saved Europe, but 
save us from the Belgians. As far as I'm concerned, Belgianitis has quite abated. Now, what you see in this quote is a change in perception of Belgian refugees, but that change in perception at times turned violent as it did during anti-Belgian riots in London in May 1916. Here I've got another quote illustrating this. This is taken from a letter written by Mrs. Fernside, who lived in Fulham in 1916. The Belgians here are causing a lot of trouble. On Sunday, they nearly murdered a policeman and a soldier. And yesterday, the English people and kids collected in hundreds in Little Road, where a lot of Belgians have opened shops, and last night the scene was beyond description. Windows and shops smashed up everywhere. With the Irish, Germans, etc., not the Belgians, we have our share of the troubles. What's interesting in what's happening in Fulham in 1916 is that this type of violence is reminiscent of the type of violence that had been directed against German citizens living in Britain in 1914. One of the reasons why you see this flare-up of what is effectively xenophobic violence is because the Belgians did look and sound foreign to many locals. Many of them often confused them with Germans and mistook them for spies. In 1917 in Hampshire, in Alton, a refugee recalled how a Scottish officer had mistaken a Flemish for German and therefore proceeded to arrest a group of Belgians that, as a result, looked very suspicious to him. This is an example of how the foreignness of Belgians was turned against them at a time where their experience did not appear to grant them any specific status on the British home front. These incidents created a lot of anxiety among the Belgian populations in Britain. And as a result, the Belgian elites organized themselves and tried to devise ways to counter these stories and the notion that Belgians may not be contributed as much as they could to the war effort. One good example of this is the tour of Britain undertaken by Miss van der Velde, who is the wife of the very prominent Belgian socialist and minister in the Belgian government at the time. What she did was touring the major cities in which Belgian refugees lived, London, obviously, but Glasgow as well. And she would give speeches that would then be reprinted in the local press explaining, for instance, that those young Belgian men that you may well come across in the streets were not actually shirking their duties, but had very good reasons, often medical reasons, not to be fighting at the front. There's also a sense among the British citizens involved in supporting Belgian refugees that the hosts and local communities are realizing that there are bad apples to be found in any cart and that they're trying hard to convince people not to mistake or confuse the few problematic cases that you find among Belgian refugees as you would find in any community with the overall population. Problems of this kind were actually few and far between. By and large, Belgian refugees were not only grateful for the support they received, but also said so and demonstrated their gratitude in a number of ways during the war and, of course, after the war, because Belgian refugees strove to return home as early as possible and as early as November 1918 after the signature of the armistice. At the end of the war, in the same way that Belgium recognized and celebrated the contribution that British troops had played in liberating their country from German occupation, a number of national and local organizations, prominent politicians, commentators or intellectuals, wrote speeches, organized the sending of gifts back to the communities that had welcomed Belgian refugees during the war. And this was seen as one of the many manifestations of inter-allied solidarity that was celebrated in the immediate aftermath of the First World War. As we saw in France, Belgium also gave land to 
Britain for the creation of military cemeteries. This is one of the many ways in which allied nations celebrated their common sacrifices and the help and support they gave each other, not simply on the front lines, but also on the home front. That was Dr. Pierre Persegle on the home front and the influx of refugees during the war. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews, with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Professor Panikos Panayi about internees and prisoners of war.